Hey, this is Daniel Grove. Thanks for checking out this video. I recently made a really cool photo composite from a styled Cinderella wedding photo shoot I did recently. And I wanted to recreate this classic uh, scene and uh, piece of art from the original movie. And I saw this gazebo in the background and I wanted to recreate that at least in Blender. I went to Blender, cracked my knuckles and said, all right, I can do this. Let's make something cool. So this is what I came up with. And I'm gonna show you how to make uh, this or something very similar to this in Blender from scratch. You're gonna learn some hard surface modeling techniques, cleaning up meshes and making things look smooth and realistic. We're also gonna cover some PBR materials, inserting other 3D assets, such as this chandelier, which I got from Sketchfab. We'll talk about lighting and I'll even show you how to render a mask layer for compositing in post. All right, well, let's get started. So I am using Blender 2.91.0. I don't know why I said point and dot in the same sentence. Uh, I just, I can't make up my mind which, which I wanna use. So we're gonna start with a blank scene, delete your default cube, and we're gonna start with the base. We're gonna build from the bottom up naturally. We're gonna start with the base, which is a circle. So Shift A, go to Mesh and click Circle. Down here in your little options for the mesh, before you click out of it, remove it. Uh, it's not finalized yet, we can still change it. So let's give it eight vertices, which is gonna be eight sides. Now you can always scale it up later, but just let's make it eight meters in radius. And that's good for now. Let's go to edit mode, which is tab. Make sure all the vertices are selected, which they should be by default. And let's press R, Z, which means we're gonna rotate all the vertices along the Z axis. And let's type in with your keyboard or your numpad, 22.5. So that's 22.5 degrees. We rotated everything, which makes it flat, you know, oriented in the way that we're used to seeing as opposed to this. So RZ22.5 and enter. All right, now we're still in edit mode with all the vertices selected. Let's press the letter F on your keyboard for fill. So that gets all the vertices that are selected, fills it with a face, and now we are on our way. So we do need to switch to face selection mode up here, this little, uh, the, the white square. Press one of your numpads to go to a side view. And I'm going to size this up a little bit bigger. I'm gonna to go to maybe right about there. Okay, and click to basically confirm your resizing, which is S for scale. All right, so I'm going to pretend I'm happy with that for now. Press one again for a side view, and let's turn this flat octagon into a three-dimensional shape by pressing the letter E, which is extrude. And I'm going to bring it up to that square on the grid right there. I'm gonna use the, these, uh, grid squares to basically help me make perfect steps for the you know octagonal stair step. Um, okay, so we made our first step. Now let's press the letter, oh, let's go back to our side view. Let's press the letter I for inset. Look very closely. I'm going to stop right there at this square. Press E to extrude up. Okay, we got two steps. Press I again for inset, click, and E for extrude, click, or enter. All right, there we go, we've got three steps. Good enough for right now. So that's the uh, basics of the bottom piece. To add some photorealism, we don't want these shapes to be so perfectly sharp. Look how sharp these things are. I mean, you could cut your foot on that. So let's add some bevel. So go to the uh, wrench icon, which is not a spanner. Sorry, my European friends. <laughs> Just had to insert that in there. Um, add modifier and uh, bevel. I always lose my modifiers. There it is, bevel. Okay, now we don't want it this much beveled. We're going to shrink the bevel by holding shift, clicking, and then dragging. When you hold shift and drag any numerical parameter in Blender, it fine tunes it and you can get a lot more precision. Now we do want maybe three segments. So that kind of smooths it out there, nice. Also, before we move on to making the columns, if you notice on my original model, I have golden edged steps. I just wanted to be real extra, right? So to do that, we're going to go into edit mode, which is tab. Select the uh, edge select mode. And if I hold alt or option on Mac and right click or whatever your selection, whether it's left click or right click for select, um, if you click on one edge, it should get a whole, basically the rate, the perimeter. So if I hold alt over here and right click or there, see it gets the whole thing around the whole shape. That's good. So let's start with the top. Now I'm still holding alt. I'm going to add shift to that. So I'm holding alt and shift. I'm gonna select this edge and this edge. If I zoom out, Look at this, I got all the edges, right? Cool. 
I'm going to bevel these the manual way. Now we already have bevel applied, that's okay, but we're gonna add more bevel. So control B, and we're getting that, and I uh, need to add a few segments, so I'm gonna hit plus, maybe six or so segments. I'm gonna leave it right about, I'll hold sh holding shift again to get really more of a, a small increment there. Okay, that's fine, I'm gonna hit enter. Now I'm going to apply a gold material to just these faces, but I don't want it on this top face, right? Because this is the top, the stone surface. So with these all still selected, hold shift and select this face, which will basically deselect it. Cool. Now, just to save it, to be safe in case I screw it up, go to this little triangle guy, add a vertex group. You could name it golden edge, enter and click assign. Awesome. Now we've got all these faces saved into this selection. We can use it later to reselect it. And um, let's give it some material. So if, let's go to the material tab, click new. I'm just gonna call this stone and then make another one in the second slot and call it gold. Now with these faces selected right now, if I click assign, it's going to assign gold to those faces. So I'm gonna do that, assign, okay? Now we can't see anything because first of all, we haven't done anything to these materials. And second of all, we're not even in the material preview mode. So let's go to that here and let's make the gold, just give it a color, you know, kind of a golden orangey yellow color right there. Let's increase the metallic slider all the way up, specular up and roughness, I don't know, I'm around 0.3. Uh, and you know, that, that can definitely use some fine tuning later, but you get the point. We've got gold on the edges and that is how you assign a material to specific parts of a mesh. Okay, let's move on and make the columns. This is a really fun part. So with our 3D cursor still in the center, which if it is not, you can press Shift C and it restores it to the center. Let's press Shift A, add a cylinder. Let's give it uh, some more vertices. I say 80, enter, and uh, it's hidden. It's inside the stairs right now. It's kind of poking out the bottom. All right, I'm trying to move my cylinder up, but look at this, everything is moving together. You know why? Because I accidentally have this guy turned on, proportional editing objects. When that little circle is blue, that means proportional editing is turned on, which means everything around it will move. Even though I have just the stairs selected, if I move it, the cylinder, the cylinder moves with it. So let's turn that off. <laughs> All right, now I can move my column cylinder up. So GZ, here we go. Okay, we need to make this really tall. So go into edit mode with face mode selected, grab that top face and GZ again, just to move it up really tall. Now this is up to you if you want it to be more of a realistic proportion, or if you're going for more of a fantasy look like I did, I made it really tall, like probably unsafely, impossibly tall. Um, <laughs> twice as tall as it probably should have been, but I like it, okay? So I'm gonna leave it right there. Um, let's go to top mode, which is numpad seven. If you find things hard to see because of the material preview, you can go back to object or even better wireframes since we don't have a whole lot of polygons going on. Uh, the, the top view is very easy to look at. Okay, so we're gonna move this column over here, make sure that it is selected, which it's bright orange for me. I'm going to press G for grab or move, and I'm going to put it right up against the edge of one of these corners. I zoom in with the plus button, hold uh, shift and alt, I can click and drag, that's just how my settings are set up, or I can uh, emulate the third mouse button because I'm using a stylus right now, so I don't have a scroll wheel or a third mouse button. Okay, so I've got it over there and I'm happy with that. Now we need to rotate this around the center point seven more times, right, to get eight columns. Um, but oh, look at our 3D cursor, it's not in the right place. We're going to move that to the center with Shift C. Now it's in the middle. And now I can use that as a pivot point uh, or an orientation point to copy this around in the circle. Okay, so our, our cursor's in the middle. Let's switch our orientation editing mode to 3D cursor so that if I press R, Look, it's not rotating the cylinder, it's rotating it around the, the 3D cursor, which is in the middle, that's good. So we're gonna make some copies with Alt-D, which makes a, an identical, uh, basically a clone of the mesh. If I edit or change a material on this, you know, any cylinder, all the other clones of it will mimic that exact change. So Alt-D, then R, and then 45. Look at that, we got one of them placed. Now don't press or type anything else because we're gonna use Shift-R to replicate our last commands. Ah, oh, look at that, isn't that nice and fast? And like I said, these are all clones, so watch, if I edit one of these, look at that, they all copy me 
that's a lot of time saved, right? You do not want to say, oh man, I need to improve or fix or change this one thing. I got to do it seven more times. Crap. Uh, none of that. So I love the uh, Alt-D. It's great. If you do Shift-D, it will not be an identical copy. It'll be an independent uh, mesh with its own data. Okay, so we've got this. Let's um, make uh, the top of the columns go up a little bit and then open up. Oh, look at this. When I scale this, what is it scaling from? That 3D cursor, look at that. So we need to fix it. Go back to individual origin. Okay, scale it up a little bit and maybe extrude one more time. Okay, so we got our columns. Next is we need our top piece. So I kind of went with a square for some reason in my original design and I, I don't hate it, but it is a little odd. So I'm gonna make another octagon and then I might transition into circles because the top is going to be a dome. So with our 3D cursor in the middle, let's add another circle. Make sure it's got eight sides. Go into tab. We need to select median point for this to work. So there, RZ22.5, there we go. I'm gonna get out of edit mode by pressing the tab key and then GZ to move it up. S to scale it out a little bit, make sure it is bigger than the columns. Edit mode, which is tab. F for fill, remember to give it a face. And then I can E and extrude it upwards a little bit. Just a little bit, cool. Now I do encourage you to, before you get too deep into uh, you know making your, your shapes in your own architectural style, uh, don't try to reinvent the wheel like I am doing right now. Go look at some actual architectural designs of gazebos. Type in stone gazebo or medieval gazebo you'll find all kinds of really beautiful pieces of, I mean, architectural art, they really are. And you can copy those to make things easier, or you can do things a difficult way like me and just try to guess and make things look realistic. <laughs> so I've got my first shape. Let's add some ridges. So what those are is I'm going to press I, drag it in and click, and then E, and then E enter, scale out that extrusion out, extrude it up again, I drag it in a little bit, click and E for extrude. So what I'm doing is let me go to a better view. There we go, maybe there. So I just added some ridges there, give it some kind of fine detail. If something is large, you do have to add really small details to make it look large. It's kind of strange. It might seem a little backwards to you, um, but fine details give the impression of scale and size. All right, now I'm going to extrude this again, and I'm just gonna scale this out to kind of like, Reach out and then E to extrude. E to extrude again to scale that out. Try to do the same angle, almost to 45. That looks pretty nice, right? Looks kind of Greek, very strong. And now here I'm going to extrude up one more time. I'm gonna add a circle element up here. So with this face selected, I can press Shift S and cursor to select it. Now my 3D cursor is right there in the middle of this face, see? Instead of down there at the base, all right? Um, you can make a new mesh or you can continue to add to this mesh. So shift A, circle, give it a lot of points, maybe 360, <laughs> scale it up, pass those little, those little sharp edges, right? Make it bigger than the octagon. F for fill, E to extrude it up. Let's make a big ridge and then let's give it some small ridges here. This part really might not even be visible. <laughs> When you render it, GZ to move that, that piece up. Cool. And then another big ridge, inset that, raise it up. And I'm gonna make the dome right here. Okay, so I've got this face selected. Let's move our 3D cursor up here. So Shift S down here, cursor to selected. Shift A and let's add a sphere. And let's give it a lot of, a lot of pieces so it's nice and smooth. So I'm gonna say 100 and 80. Scale it up. Now I will show you a trick to, to smooth out your meshes without really having to add a, a whole bunch of high poly you know, faces to it. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna cut off the bottom of the sphere. So GZ to move it up here just for a minute. Press one to go to a flat side view. Turn on your X-ray up here so that when we select faces, it's actually gonna grab the faces on the other side. So Alt A to unselect everything. Press, oh, make sure you're in face mode up here. Press B for box select. And then you, look at this, you can just draw a box. And look, because X-ray is on, aha, we've grabbed all the faces all the way around. Delete key, delete faces. All right, now uh, I'm gonna grab this whole thing. A quick way to do that is just select one of the faces 
and then press Control L or Command L if you're on Mac. And turn off your x-ray mode because it gets a little confusing. GZ to move this down. Awesome. All right, look at that. Not too shabby. A little bit better than my original design, if I do say so myself. And I do. All right, next thing, we're going to add some little square ridges to give it some further stony detail. And then we'll get on with the texturing of, uh, the, of, the, of the stone. Uh, let's get out of edit mode into object mode. Shift A, add a cube. Good old trusty cube. Go to your move tool so we can move it out here. And I'm going to change the shape of it. Uh, if you press the period key on your numpad, look at this. It zooms right in, maybe a little too close. Press minus to zoom out. All right, so I'm going to scale this down with S. Maybe scale it up on the Z axis alone. Like that, move it in a little bit. Cool. And then I'm going to bevel this edge right here. So control B, if you have bool tools enabled, you can just do control B. That is an add-on that comes with Blender, but it's not enabled by default for some weird reason. Hey, look at this. My bevel is not like right. It's not even. Uh, that's because the scale of this shape, if I go to my object information, look at this, I've got scale. It's not even. So to erase your scale and basically set it back to one without changing your shape, press control A, which is the apply menu and apply scale. Now look. My scales are all one. That's cool. All right, now let's do that bevel again. You'll see what, what how it looks different. With this edge selected, Control B. Look at that. That's what I wanted. Add a few more segments. Cool. Maybe uh, inset this, extrude it in, give it some shape. All right. Scale that down. Okay, I'm getting a little too too detailed. <laughs> Now we're gonna do another kind of radial copying trick again with our cursor in the middle. So let's go to uh, numpad seven for a flat above view. Make sure 3D cursor is in the center. Switch your origin point to 3D cursor. Now press Alt D R and let's try 10 degrees. Oh, that's good. Okay, now we're gonna re we're gonna replicate that a whole bunch of times with Shift R. Do 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 all the way around. You can hold it. Just be careful. A few more. There we go. So 10 degrees separation. We've got this really cool structure that maybe is a little too modern looking. I don't know. But you know, the cool thing about it is because we pressed Alt D, I can edit this <laughs> and look, I can edit all of them. So I'm going to cover this up or the, the bad way by just pressing F. Yeah, that looks a little better. I don't really like that inset thing. Okay, awesome. All right, I'm going to leave that there. And now let's get to texturing this bad boy. So Let's uh, divide our view in half this way. We can see the whole thing. Let's change this view to the shader editor. And now um, only our base has that stone texture, remember, up here stone. But I'll show you a quick way to copy that to all of these other meshes. Okay, now we have nothing but meshes that need the stone material on it. So we can press A for select all, and then shift select the base, which makes it a brighter orange which means it's the active object. Now, yeah, we have everything selected, but this bottom one, brighter orange, is the active one, right? The main one. So now, with this being the main one, we can press Control L, which is uh, make links, and look at this, materials. Uh -huh. So now, we just basically copied materials from base to all of the other shapes, including the gold one, which you don't really need, but that's okay. We won't use it on everything. Um, Okay, so yeah, we all, the stone material has been copied to everything, and now we can get to editing. Oh, before we do that, let's do that smoothing trick I mentioned. See how we can see these faces up here in the sphere? Press W, and then Shade Smooth. If you don't see that menu or that option, just do Spacebar or whatever your search is, and type in Smooth or Shade, and um, there it is, Shade Smooth. Awesome, now we get this weird, you know, smooth artifact there. Fix that by going to the object info here and then normals and then check auto smooth at 30 degrees. That um, that means anything, uh, what is it, less than 30 degrees gets smoothed. Anything more than it will, will be a hard angle. But yeah, that's all smooth. All right, now as promised, materialing. <laughs> I'm gonna press in to get rid of the side panel. Get myself some more room. Uh, with node wrangler add-on enabled, I can select the uh, BSDF shader here and press Control Shift T, and this is going to load uh, a whole bunch of texture images and plug them all into where they need to go 
on the BSDF. So I'm going to go to my shaders folder. I have this really great uh, PBR material that um, is called Concrete 20. I'm pretty sure I got this uh, from um, CCO Textures. I will correct myself if I'm wrong and uh, I'll leave the link for it regardless in the video description down below. So with all these here, I'm going to uh, select them all. So holding shift, there we go. Now watch, see how, see how that says principal texture setup? Oh, look at that, awesome. A whole bunch of work was just done instantly. Now I don't want the displacement, so I'm going to delete that. And I prefer to use a bump node for, the, uh, for this guy, for the normals. And then I'm gonna plug in displacement into the height actually. There we go. Now we can turn this way down, which we will. Let's zoom in a little bit, see what's going on here. It looks like a planet. <laughs> so let's turn our strength down to 0.5 and distance down to 0.1. Very subtle, you know, stony texture. Really, these are quite smooth and professionally done. So you don't want a whole bunch of jagged edges anyway, or it's not gonna look like they knew what they were doing. All right, now we do need to unwrap some of these. So like this cylinder piece right here, I don't know what's going on, but there's like no material wrapped around it. So let's uh, tab, turn off our x-ray mode. Okay, with one of these selected, I'm gonna press Control L. It's that whole you know linked mesh. And then U and Smart UV Project. There we go, we have texture. Now let's go to our um, UV editor. And let's see how it's unwrapping it. So watch, I can click on these different faces and it shows me where the face is on the UV map over here. Okay. So let's look at the scale of this. If this is a large stone stru structure, these, you know, these stone details are gonna be pretty small. So let's um, go back in edit mode. Let's press A, which again, because I have this button turned on, which is a sync selection turned on, I can scale these on the UV map. And if I make them bigger, that makes the texture inside them smaller, right? Now the stone details are much smaller. I'm going to um, get this cylinder piece, Control L to select it. Look at these faces down, look how small they are. They're, they're just too small. I need to scale those up. The sphere looks okay for now. So Control L, get these guys. I'm gonna scale these up independently. They're about twice as big as they were. There, I'm, I'm happier with that. And we got this funny little square that I cheated on. <laughs> That's not um, properly done. So let's just select the whole thing of this little cube array, U and Smart UV Project. Okay, good. I'm pretty happy with that scale. All right, now we can see that this is a very tall cylinder, but apparently these are not scaled appropriately. That's why the texture seems to be kind of stretching. At least it looks like it to me, it's just stretching vertically. That's not good. So grab any of the cylinders, tab for edit mode, press A to select all, and let's scale this on the Y axis. So S, Y, look at that. Now we can try to get somewhat of a proportional spread of this image. That looks way better already. Now let's scale it overall up as well. So just S, there we go, cool. Now, if you get any kind of repeating textures that don't look right because all these cylinders have the same texture, you can rotate them. Just grab it, press, um, it make sure you're on individual origin up here. You can rotate this on its own, independent of all the other guys. So if you get repeating textures, just rotate it and you should be able to cover that up. Um, up here, this, this part of it has not unwrapped very well. Yeah, if I zoom in here, look at that. It's just like super stretched. So I'm gonna hold Alt and select this ring and then Control Plus to grow that selection. Now I'm gonna unwrap this on its own. So Smart UV Project, a little better. Okay, I'll just keep it like that. Awesome. Now if you really wanna get fancy, you can add some like stone arches here. You can add that kind of curvy Roman column topper, which I attempted to do in my original. It didn't look great, but it, it looked okay. Um, I, that's just, a, uh, that's gonna take too much time in this tutorial, so. I'll leave that to you to however, whatever column you want to do. Um, if you want to be accurate, look up eras of architecture and don't just look at, you know, I'm going to add this Roman column to this medieval archway and then this Gothic, you know, like dome. Don't do that. Be, do a little bit of homework and try to keep your architecture within the same era. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. Uh, this bottom piece did not unwrap. So control L, U, 
Smart UV project, okay. Uh, looks a little rough and bumpy. So I'm gonna scale this all up. About two times bigger than it was. That's better. Cool, cool, cool. All right, oh, I forgot to do the bottom piece done here. Um, let's grab the bottom face. I can't see it because it's inside the steps. So let's turn on our X-ray. Let me get rid of this guy. X-ray, there it is. Let's move it up, so GZ. And then we're gonna do a little extrusion, really small, scale that up, then extrude that down. There we go. It just gives it a better resemblance of, you know, being a strong, structurally sound thing. Um, but however, the UVs are all screwed up now. So edit mode, control plus plus, to grab our newly made piece. U, smart UV project, okay. And it's all over here, let's scale it up. There we go, that looks fine. Now the bottom steps are not UV unwrapped either. So tab, A for all, U, smart UV project, there we go. Smart UV project is pretty great. There are some times when it's not, doesn't fit the bill, um, but for stuff like this, basic geometry, nothing organic, it works really good. Cool, maybe scale it up a little bit more. All right, all right, all right. Let's give it some room up in here for the chandelier. So edit, grab this bottom face, there it is. I for inset, E for extrude upwards, and you can kinda scale that in, maybe raise it up again. Oh, it's touching the bottom of the cylinder mesh that I have. <laughs> Geezy, move it down, there it is, okay. All right, now the UVs are messed up because we're extruding, so Control plus plus, U, my UV project, cool. Now let's add in a 3D asset that I got from Sketchfab. All I did was I went to sketchfab.com, typed in medieval chandelier, and there are a bunch of killer, free, and some paid models that are really great for using, from learning from. Um, yeah, lots of cool stuff. So I use this one. The artist's name apparently is Kevin Papescu. I hope I said that right. Uh, and click download. Choose your format. I went with FBX. And once you have it downloaded to your folder, remember to keep things organized. Please, for the love of all, everything, keep your folders and assets organized. I'm gonna to go to File, Import, and FBX. Then I'm going to find it inside of my Sketchfab folder. Yes, I, look at this. I have a whole folder of Sketchfab assets because it's just that good. Um, let's see, are they organized by date? They are, so Medieval Chandelier, chandelierasset.fbx, click Import FBX, I don't see it anywhere, but look, it's way down there. I'm gonna press that period button again, and it's so tiny. Look at this little guy. It's like a chandelier for the mice living underneath the steps. So we need to scale this up majorly. So I'm gonna zoom out, S10. Yeah, not bad, maybe a little bit more. S to scale it up some more. Move it straight up. Let's press period to zoom in to where it is. There you go, let's get that kind of holding piece right on the edge of the stone, awesome. Now, this has a whole bunch of empties. I'm not sure if these were used for lights or animation or something. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of weird. Yeah, that's a little better. So if those bother you, you can hide them, you can delete them. Um, all right, so let's look at this real quick. This is a geniusly made mesh, it's very nice. Got a, probably a substance painter, a painted texture on it. And the flame has its own image. And look at, look at this, this is so clever. I'm going to select this mesh and zoom in. There's two, flame images, look at this. So that when there's transparency around, uh, uh, applied, which I'll show you in a second, the flame really does look three-dimensional. You can't really tell this is two images intersecting when, we get, when it's rendered and we've got transparency. It's really nice. You could even add some kind of animated uh, flickering with a driver. You could add some wobbling distortion to give it some you know, wiggling if you're doing a video. And I'm sure you could get it to look pretty pretty uh, realistic. If you animate the height, and you know the angle just a little bit, add some some noise jittering there. So let's look at the uh, node real quick to see how they made this. Shader editor, here we go. So we've got file two and file three. I don't know what those are. So we can go to image editor. Here we go, file two is the flame. And file three is the alpha of the flame, interesting. And file one, look at this, this is the map, the texture map of the whole chandelier, even with the melted wax. I love the melted wax, it's so cool. So let's go back to Shader Editor. And um, I don't like to uh, set things up like this when I'm dealing with alpha. 
what I like to do is delete this guy. Let's add two shaders, the emission shader and the transparency shader. There we go. And then an add uh, mix shader, sorry. Plug the emissions to the bottom one, transparent to the top. Now the, uh, the, the factor, which is basically a mask input, is going to be the alpha file, which is uh, file three. And then the color, let's organize these a little bit more logically. The um, color of the emissions, which is where the light's gonna be generated from, is going to be file two, which is just the normal picture of the fire. Flame, sorry. There we go. And then plug this in here, of course, there. And voila, we don't have any transparency yet, but if we go to rendered view, we still don't have transparency. Um, let's check on our engine. Ah, oh, we're not in cycles. Let's go to cycles. And now we have transparency. This might look weird or it might not work. Let me show you how to fix that. Go back to EV with the chandelier selected. Go down to materials. Scroll down a little bit and here we go. This is an annoying, it's almost like a bug, I feel, because it needs to be fixed. You need to change this in EV to blend or hashed or clip. And then you have to go back cycle sometimes, which like I said, is just really weird to me. I don't understand why I need to switch engines, change the setting and come back. But uh, regardless, I generally have to do that to get this uh, transparency to work. And we have transparency. Cool, see there's no black card around the image. Now we can control the brightness of the fire by turning this up to maybe 100. Look at that, it's actually emitting light. How cool. Now this is in cycles, uh, EV will not do that. EV will also take just a few seconds to render, or in cycles might take a few minutes depending on your computer. I have an RTX 2080, so it'll render you know decently quick, um, but I still need to wait if I want a lot of realistic light going on. So I don't wanna have to increase this too much, so I'm going actually gonna add some lights to add light to my scene. So with the thing selected, Shift S, cursor to selected, Shift A, let's add some lights, let's do point lights. I'm gonna move this one up and let's go to the light tab and add a little bit of an orange yellow color to it. Make the power a lot. Let's try one megawatt, 1.21 gigawatts. Okay, that's too much. Maybe 100 watts, maybe 200 watts. <laughs> try 500 watts. I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just really experimenting. Okay. That's all right for now. You know, they are just candles after all. They're not, they're not uh, super bright. So cool. And now if you really want to get uh, you know, accurate, you can move this light above each flame and have each flame emitting its own, you know, point light. Um, but for now, I'm going to leave this in the middle, even though it's making some weird shadows. Uh, I'll just have to get over that later. All right, this is looking pretty, pretty sweet right now in cycles. I really love how it's doing this concrete, you know, texture looks great. Our light can be improved by changing the color. It's really way down here. So let's move that up where we can grab it. And this is a sunlight. So it doesn't matter where it is in the scene. It can be on the other side of the mesh, <laughs> but the angle of the sun, you know, is still decided by the light. Uh, but I do like to have it over here to make things simpler. So let's make it a little bit blue because I, I imagine uh, my render, you know, kind of being a moonlit render. So I made it bluish, not super bright. There we go. We also get this beautiful contrast of a cool main light source and a warm interior light source. I even added uh, an extra light inside to warm it up even more. So grab that light and press Alt D Z. There we go. Maybe make this 800 watts. Now remember, I did Alt D, which means these two lights are the same. So look, that one's 800, this one's 800. And I just, I really like that cold on the outside, warm on the inside. Let's do a few final touches and let's add that golden kind of framework up top. And again, I don't know if that's historic, historically accurate, but it sure looks cool. <laughs> so let's um, get our cursor up here. Shift S, cursor to selected. It's right there above the, um, above the chandelier. Shift A, let's add a curve, Bezier curve. And let's drag it out here. It's actually flat. It's kind of laying down, right? We don't want that. Let's do RY90, enter, RZ90, enter. And again, I have individual origins selected. So it's rotating around itself, not around the 3D cursor. Okay, now the bottom point of this Bezier curve is perfectly downward, which is good. 
We're gonna move it right up against the edge of the sphere, this half sphere, the dome really. Uh, sorry, let's get rid of the shader. We don't really need this anymore. I have a habit of leaving windows open and wasting space on my screen. Okay, so tab. Now let's grab this top point, move it all the way up here to the top. And this is, as you can see, a perfect 45. So if we wanna be all mathematically accurate, R negative 45 to flatten it out. Let's go to wireframe mode and look at this. Our curve is kind of cutting through. We can actually subdivide a curve to give us more control. So with both points selected, spacebar, SUB, D, there it is, segments, subdivide. Look at this, now we got a point in the middle. So select it and G for move. We can put it right out here, try to find that perfect kind of in between point. And the curves are still cutting through. That's because the top point and the bottom point are small. So I'm gonna select this bottom one and press S for scale. And I want the curve to come just outside of the dome. Like I want it to hug right along the edge because we're gonna make this into a pipe. Okay, this top piece, let's scale that up. Move it up right above the dome. There we go, cool. So we've got this curve going right along the edge of the dome. Let's add some more segments so it's not noticeably low polygon. Maybe just 20 will be fine. And here's where the magic is. Let's go back to material view. Um, use the depth, hold shift and drag the depth slider. Look at that. It's suddenly a pipe, three dimensional pipe. That's how you make wires and all kinds of cool stuff. Okay, let's apply the gold material to it. Gold, nice and shiny. Now with our 3D cursors in the center of everything, we can rotate this around and make kind of a, almost a wireframe around it. So shift C, get our cursor in the middle, switch this to 3D cursor origin point with this arch or arc selected, Alt D, R, Z. Let's do 30, which I think we'll add, what is it like 12 of them or 10 of them? Shift R a few times, there we go. Looks nice. And then if you want to add some other rings, like a support circles in the middle, you can do shift A curve circle, move it away up here, scale it up. Oh, we're still in 3D, we're still in 3D cursor mode. Individual, there we go. Scale it up, add some depth to it. Well, we wanna make it the same as these, so what is this? It's at dot 049, so dot 049. Oh, that didn't work. I guess because I scaled it up, that kind of screws things up. So shift and drag, <laughs> guess we got to eyeball it. There go, add some more segments because I can see the shape of it. Go up to 20, all right. Make that gold, of course, and so on and so forth. You can add some other rings or maybe one ring up here. Let's add like a spire on top. So with the dome selected, I don't want to see anything else. I want to get rid of these, or these golden you know, ribs, so press the forward slash button, which solos out whatever mesh you have selected. All right, now let's go here. Let's select uh, this ring, I'm gonna hold Alt, and very carefully, if you click in the right place, it will get this ring. Now with those edges selected, I am in edge select mode, by the way. I'm gonna press E, Z, to make sure it's extruding upwards. And then I'm gonna shrink that, E, Z, Shrink that a little bit less. We're kind of doing a curved, uh, you know, spire. Easy again, get more. You don't, you don't want it to be too big. Easy, and I'll shrink this to pretty much nothing, almost zero. There we go, nice pointy spike. Now, as always, when you extrude, the UVs get all screwed up. So, Control plus, 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 U, Smart UV Project, okay. There we go. That's good enough for me. Now to get out of the solo mode, press forward slash again. Voila, we're back. Um, I am bothered by this up here. <laughs> I'm gonna do uh, shift D Z. Scale it in. Now because we're scaling things, look at this, it's super thin. So we gotta go back to the curve settings, hold shift. There we go. Again, it's probably not gonna be visible, but you know what? To me, to me it counts. <laughs> All right, awesome. Oh, shame on me, I forgot to do. One of the most important column techniques is the uh, 
the divots or the, I don't know what it's called, little cutout things. But like I said, we're gonna do it procedurally. So this will finish out the tutorial, hopefully. <laughs> Hope it wasn't too long um, or too fast. I, I try to cover a whole lot of stuff in a short amount of time. So, you know, you're not sitting here watching a two hour tutorial. Um, so we're going to go into our stone material and we're actually going to copy the stone and make it another stone material for just the columns. So with stone selected, press this little double page thing. And now we've got its own unique, um, you know, name because it's, it's different than the other stone materials. So call it stone column, right? Now I uh, actually want the stone column to only be applied around these, oh, face mode, around these parts. So I'm going to add stone back, the normal stone, press A, apply stone to everything. Okay, so normal stone. And then I'm going to just alt click or option click this piece and then click on stone column and apply that. So hopefully I didn't lose you there. What's going on is the stone column texture, which is going to have these vertical ribs, is only applied to the, this round piece. Down here and up here is just normal stone, right? There's no, rib, uh, there's no divots or dips. So let's get into the procedural goodness. All right, now let's go to the stone column texture and let's add these vertical lines that I keep talking about. So we need to add a few nodes first, shift A and wave texture, shift A and color ramp. Connect these two from color to factor. Click on the wave texture and press control T or command T. That gives you a quick way of adding this mapping node. Um, that only works if node ringer is enabled. And then I'm going to click on the control ramp and press control shift, click on the color ramp. Now this is again a node wrangler trick, which is helping me preview what's happening here. There's no shading, there's no like, you know, light bouncing anything. It's just raw, you know, image data, I guess. Uh, procedural image data. So we've got these ribs. It looks pretty sweet, but it's not really accurate. Look, this is really big. These are really skinny. So we need to fix that. Let's go to, uh, let's try some different modes here. Let's try object. No, still uneven. Let's try UV. There we go. That's good. Now there is a, a bigger one here, but that's only because our UV can be fixed. So you really want to get nitpicky. Let's go into edit mode, grab these faces, go to your UV editor, press period to find them. There they are. S and then X and hold shift and drag. Now we can line it up perfectly. See how we're basically splitting it. Let's find a, a, a merging point and click right there. Awesome. Now there should be no gaps in the UV map, even though this is a procedural texture. Cool. Now I think there's a little too many divots going on. So let's go back to shader editor. We can turn our uh, frequency or rather our scale of the waves up or down. So a smaller number means less. Higher number means, oh, way more. So was it five? Let's go down to maybe three. And I screwed up my UV that I just fixed, but we can get pretty close to fixing it if we hold shift and drag it. Yeah, there we go. Okay, cool. That looks nice to me. Now we need to use this to affect the bump, right? So let's press Shift A, type in Mix RGB, because we already have something affecting the bump, which is this displacement texture. So I'm going to connect this ramp into the bottom spot of the mix. So we're basically just mixing this concrete bump map with my procedural bump map. And let's do multiply, so it's gonna make it darker. So let's look at what this is doing by holding Control Shift and clicking on the multiply or the mix RGB. So as we play with this, look, this is no procedural lines with zero, but then as we increase it to one, it adds it in using multiply mode because it's, so it's darkening it like in Photoshop. Cool, so you can get it to where you like it. All right, and once we're done with our little node wrangler trick, we need to just go back to what I call just normal, you know, shader view, control shift click the main BSDF and voila, we're back in normal mode. I can't see any of my procedural stuff right now. Bring this up a little bit. So let's add, let's do the same layering trick, but let's add these vertical lines into the uh, color image map, which is the base color. So we can just click on this multiply mix RGB down here, shift D to duplicate it, put it right there. Grab, let me zoom out a little bit. Grab this ramp output, which again is customizable. 
and put it in right there. All right, so I plugged my ramped wave texture uh, into the color two of the mix. So we're, again, we're mixing two images together, right? Image number one is this concrete, just basic concrete texture. And image number two, which we're mixing on top of it, is the lines. So let's go back to previewing this mix shader by doing control shift, clicking on it, which is a node wrangler trick. Now, here it is. Here's this little UV gap that I created for myself accidentally right here. If you can see it, that does not look realistic. So we can fix that by tweaking the uh, scale very carefully. So hold shift, click and drag, and let's try to, oh, 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 eh. There we go, that's good enough. Now that you're probably asking, why are you using this color ramp? Well, that's so that we can really change the shape of this. We can change basically the curvature of these uh, these dips. If we do that, <laughs> that's not right. We want it to be a, a rounded kind of cylindrical curve. Now on, on as is, it looks okay, but I feel like widening these gaps of the dark areas uh, will help, help it look a little bit more traditional. Okay, so let's go back to showing the normal shader. So control shift principled. Now the dark lines are really dark because we're actually adding it to the base color of the mesh and not just the, the height map, which is again, very weak. So let's add a little bit more in. Let's turn that up a little bit, about 0.5.6. All right, let's set up a render. So I'm gonna press zero to see what my camera sees. And it's looking at the ground because we made our scene really large. So I'm gonna press number add one. If I can see my camera, I'm just gonna move it way out here, way out there, really far out. <laughs> All right, if I press zero, I can't see anything because it's looking, not only is it not looking at the, uh, not looking at the gazebo, but the clip is so low that I can't see past 100 meters. So go to your camera tab, go to your end and increase this to like 10,000. Oh, look at that, there it is. I wasn't too far off. Now that when you're working with big scenes, your clip will keep the camera from seeing or even rendering things that are, you know, past that point and also closer than this point. If you're doing really close ups, you might wanna add another zero in there so we can still th see things right up against the camera. Lens. All right, with the camera selected, a quick way to re-aim it is press RR. This allows you to freely rotate it. Let's aim it at the gazebo. Let's rotate a little bit, just with one press of R. G to move it up or down. Here's another cool trick, press G, Z, and then Z again. And that allows you to basically zoom in and out because it's using the Z axis of the camera, which is again pointed wherever your camera is looking. And let's increase the uh, focal range to maybe 85. Let's change the render shape by going into the output settings. And let's make this um, X of 2000. Oh, typed in 2020. Yikes. And then 3000 for the Y. Cool. So that's a nice vertical two by three ratio shape, which by the way, is a ratio of any image that a DSLR will create, which has a digital camera. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom it in again a little bit. Be easy to zoom in. Be easy a little bit more. Awesome. Okay. Let's make sure our background is pure black by going to our world setting, making this black. And you can add a HDR. I know some of you were probably just waiting for me, like scratch biting at the bit for me to add a HDR. I don't always use HDR. I feel like sometimes there's just too much light in too many directions. And when I do photo composites like these, these, and these. I usually have very contrasting light. I don't have light everywhere. So my 3D model that needs to blend into my photo world, it does. I don't need light from everywhere. I want it to be very controlled light sources. So uh, yeah, so I'm, I just have my sun and uh, I want dark parts. I want shadows and contrast. And we've got our warm lights on the inside. So let's set this to uh, not render full resolution, but maybe just 50% first. So we don't waste a bunch of time. Let's set our samples to maybe 100, okay, F12. Awesome, that looks pretty great. So on my computer, this took 10 seconds to render. I've got some nice soft shadows. I love how the concrete looks, although it is a little blue, but that's because we're rendering this in a nighttime setting, right? The sun is actually blue colored in this scene. I, I, I added light blue to the sun. Um, and the, the gold looks beautiful, it's shining, and those highlights look awesome. Down here, you know, we've got the little edged steps gold. If you wanna add, add some more shine to that, you can add a glare to the compositor nodes and it'll add some life to it. Let's do that real quick. Let's move our camera down. 
the scene is so big, I have to like <laughs> move my camera in very small increments. R R. Now, I if I want to rotate my camera around perfectly around a circle, make sure your 3D cursor is in the center. Switch to 3D cursor origin point mode with the camera selected R Z. And look at that. We're rotating the camera around the 3D cursor. Now, to make things more photographic and interesting, I'm going to put this where the sun is hitting it right from the side. Okay, re center everything. Photographer and me just will not let me leave things uncentered. But it will let me waste space on my screen by having dialogues open forever. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand me. Okay, let's go back to our settings and let's turn the uh, resolution all the way up. Maybe add some more samples, 150. Make sure denoising is turned on, which is here. And then the bottom, check on denoising. And let's turn up these lights on the inside. Let's make them a little bit stronger for a more dramatic effect. Let's put up to 1200 watts and render. All right, here we go. This took a minute and 13 seconds and it's looking really nice. Got lots of beautiful dark shadows over here. The gold is shining. I could probably move these golden rims a little closer to the stone. I don't like that gap. I want it to be like against the stone. Um, these edges are too sharp, so I would like to add some bevel to smooth those out um, to make that a little bit more photorealistic. Uh, that chandelier looks amazing because, <laughs> well, I didn't make it, so that's probably why. Um, <laughs> and these ridges on the stone just aren't quite cutting it for me. Get it? Huh? Uh, they just look a little cartoony, so I'm going to fix that with the, with the ramp and some um, node adjustments. Love that shiny gold. Looks great. So let's go back to Blender. Switch to your compositor mode. Make sure this is turned on. So turn on use nodes. So we've got our render layers going to our composite output, which is the image that you see here. If you look on the top right, this is the composite, right? It's composed of whatever we do in the middle, which is nothing right now, but we're gonna add a glare node. So shift A, click on search, type in GL glare, put it right in the middle. Now, if you go back to your render, look, we have these weird starry shiny things because the glare node is set to Streaks, which I don't like. Go to Fog Glow, which I do like. We can change the threshold, maybe 0.2. See what that does. Oh, look, we've got the candles shining nice and bright, and there is some glare around the highlight of the gold. Subtle, but it is there. So if you like 0.2, that's cool. You can change that, of course. Higher quality will make it smoother, but also a little bit smaller. See how it shrinks? Um, I don't like that. You can only increase the size to nine for some weird reason. It isn't really that big. I would like future versions of Blender to fix that. That'd be cool. Um, so there we go. That's how to make your metal shine. Let's go and tweak those column ridges. So shader editor, oh, sorry, 3D viewport here and shader editor over here. Click on the stone column. And I think it's because we have this bump turned down so much. So I'm actually gonna set this to mix instead of multiply. So that it will literally be crossfading between the stone bump and the uh, procedural bump. Make this a more of a black. Go. All right. So if we preview this, Control Shift, click on it. This is stone bump. This is procedural bump. We want a little bit of stone bump in there to break it up. But mostly we want our procedural bump. That means we can um, turn our overall bump up and it'll be more visible. So Control click the principal to get it back to normal view. And I'm just going to turn up the strength maybe to 0.5. We can already see, look at that, the shader in the viewport alone is changing based on how much we turn up this distance. Uh, so don't get crazy. Let's just put it at like one. Let's switch over to rendered view and see what this looks like. Oh, look at that. Oh, back in. It's actually adding, <laughs> I love I love Blender. It's adding, because this is bump and normals really, it's adding lighting effects to this completely flat cylinder, but it's simulating geometry because of normals. So that's a bit much. Let's maybe dial it to 0.5. Yeah, a little smoother. And let's make this pure black. Drag it over here. Okay. Let's see, what happens if we move black up? It gets wider in between the bumps, right? And then if we move white up, it makes it, the bumps are actually very flat and wide. We don't want that. So still leave it around there. Let's maybe move our strength to dot four. And distance to dot four. There we go. We zoom out, really see the effect of the highlights on there. Yeah, that looks pretty sweet. And we can, of course, turn down the color of those lines so it's not too, you know, over the top. 
got three. Awesome. Okay, the final touch is adding that bevel modifier. Let's go back to material preview mode because in real world, the only edges that are truly sharp are knives. So let's fix this. So I'm, I've selected this whole mesh, which is this, uh, you know, octagonal piece, the big rims and the dome, they're all one mesh. So let's apply a bevel mm -hmm. modifier. But we're gonna choose the limit method angle. So it's only going to bevel angles that are um, less than 30 degrees in this case. So I'm going to add four segments of bevel. Okay, now at, at these angles, this should be beveling. Now what's going on is we have a clamp is by default turned on, kind of as a safety precaution to keep things from getting crazy in your meshes. But look what happens when we turn this off. Look at that. It is beveling beautifully all these edges that are uh, more than 20 degrees. What if we go up to 45? Oh, well, this one, you can't probably couldn't tell it, but this angle went flat. Let's go up a little bit more to 60. Oh, those went flat because those are uh, less than 60. If I go to 90, now everything pretty much, <laughs> there's no beveling because everything is uh, less than 90. So I'm going to put it at maybe 40. That looks pretty, pretty okay. We do have some weird artifacts going on with this face right here, this kind of rim. But that's because the size of this is smaller. The size of the, the height of this face is larger than the beveling size, 0.1 meters. So let's make this a little bit smaller of a bevel. You'll see it should go back to normal. Yeah, there we go. And that's better anyway. You don't want a whole bunch of smoothing. Uh, it's just the, it's just the really the, the sharp edges should be smoothed off. And you can tell in the render. You really can tell when sharp edges are, are fixed. There we go. Artifacts. I mean, that just may be a little too smooth. Let's do dot o two. Dot o one five. Okay, I'm I'm happy with that. You might want to do the same beveling trick down here because some of these edges are still pretty sharp, like these ones around the corners and these ones where the seat where the where the steps come out is just like almost unrealistically sharp. So now we already have a bevel here, and I'm going to tweak this a little bit. I'm going to turn off clamp overlap which allows it to smooth out those, those faces right there. And I really only want to smooth out the, this edge and this edge, everything else. I mean, these edges are already smooth because we added a manual bevel. So let's grab, uh, let's go to wireframe mode, one, two, three. Now, instead of doing that over and over, I could probably just select them by length. So right click on one of them, shift G and then length. Mm, that didn't quite work. All right, so with one of them selected, Shift G Direction. Ah, this is a great trick. It doesn't always work. But in this case, the only edges I want to select are all going the same direction, upwards. So sweet, we just got that. Now we're gonna get these uh, this crease, click on that and that. All right, now we're gonna go uh, to this Transform panel. If it's not there, press the letter N and turn your edges data mean bevel weight all the way to one. And they turn blue in the viewer. That means the weight is all the way up. So get out of edit mode, go to your bevel modifier, do limit, limit method to weight. Okay, now I uh, turn off clamp overlap. Let's turn that, give that off. And if we turn this up, you'll see that it is beveling those edges that we selected. Pretty cool. Now it's hard to tell right now because we've got this texture on here. There we go, this is a better view. So I'm turning up and down the bevel. It's only beveling those edges with the weight at one, at all the way up, it turned up to one. Now to avoid seeing these edges here, we can actually smooth shade this. So W, smooth shade, object properties, and then turn on auto smooth right there. A Little bit of an artifact with these edges, but I don't think it's a big deal because we've got metal kind of edging around those, those steps. Okay, so let's move on from the modeling and texturing and I'll show you one last thing, which is how to render a mask layer. So I use this because my final product was going to be a still image in Photoshop. And I wanted to be able to use Photoshop as my compositor to add the people in, to add shadows, to add the background, of course, and all that stuff. And I did have parts of the bride's wedding dress that needed to be behind this column. And I wanted to do that in Photoshop specifically, not in Blender, so I'd have more control over it. So to do that, I use the object index to make a separate render of just these two front columns as black and white, which I used as a mask. I'll show you how to do that now. Go over here and select your foreground objects that you need a mask for. 
go to the object information tab, go to relations and pass index, move it up to one or that column and then the other one up to one as well. So these will be rendered on their own pass, uh, which will just be black and white. Everything will be black except for these. And then to render that pass, we do need to turn pass on. So go to your view layer properties tab, open passes and select object index, right there indexes. Now sure you can use cryptomat. I know that's way more like advanced, but I just need a mask of two, like one, two objects. It's really not a big deal. Very simple. And honestly, I found cryptomat to be rather confusing. All right, nice and fast. Now up here is where you can view your passes. So we have to go to view layer. And now we have all these passes, which are look over here, checked on. So we can go to depth, which I don't have set up. Normal, kind of cool, shows all the normals. I uh, don't, that's the ambient occlusion. Emission is just the candles. Mist, which I don't have set up. And object index, look at this, a perfect mask. Now to save it as black and white, you can go to just color and you know, image, save as, and save it as a PNG or whatever you need. And voila, you've got your perfect edged mask using Photoshop um, or anything else, video compositor. Uh, you know, you could make this an image sequence or a video as well if you have a moving scene and you've got a perfect cutout mask for whatever you're using later in post. And I hope that is very helpful. Hope you enjoyed this video. Be sure to subscribe to the channel. Let me know if you like what I'm making. If you have any questions, comments, or complaints, uh, <laughs> send it in the comments down below. I do my best to answer everyone's questions. And I love seeing y'all's work. You can send me your renders that you're proud of to daniel at danielgrovephoto.com. And be sure to check out my other Blender videos I've got on my channel because I think they're pretty sweet. And uh, most of the other viewers do too. So thanks for watching and have a great week.